As you can see, we are two panelists and one um, somewhat despotic commentator, <coughs> rather than three panelists and one commentator. Um, Mr. Maham, unfortunately, his son was in a car accident, and so he was unable to join us. So that um, we wish his son a good recovery. Um, that gives us a little bit more time for our two panelists to be more expansive. It will hopefully give us time for a little bit longer and perhaps a more conversational discussion rather than a formal Q&A. Um, if we run out of things to talk about, it will also give us an earlier end time. We're flexible up here. Um, so I'm going to just briefly introduce the names of our panelists, and then I'll introduce them each um, individually when they speak. This is, just as a destination check, um, the panel on what might a post-Assad Syria look like, exploring scenarios and addressing challenges. And our two panelists for today are Rafif Zorzati <coughs> and Joshua Landis. Um, and Josh has requested, <coughs> as the person with a pessimistic outlook, that he be the one to speak first. Um, so I will introduce him formally first. Um, Josh is not only a long-term friend, which is why I can say these things, um, but is also um, better known as, and thank you so much, Danny, for giving me the large type on the bios here, is Associate Professor of Middle Eastern Studies at the University of Oklahoma, and he is also Director of the University's Center for Middle East Studies. He's President of the Syrian Studies Association, a delightful scholarly association that you might consider being involved with if you are interested in Syria we can tell you about the inexpensive the newsletter editors mm -hmm. right here. Yeah, we work. can tell you about the inexpensive annual dues, particularly those for students afterwards stop by and see us. Um, he also, I think, is perhaps best known among around the world as the writer, editor, and founder of Syria Comment. Um, which I think needs no introduction, but most of you probably know it because it comes into your email inbox um, every day or every other day. It's an e-blog newsletter, um, and it, according to this, attracts some 200,000 page reads a month and is widely read by officials in Syria, Europe, Washington, and I think that's only the start of the list, not the exhaustive list. Um, if he sounds familiar to you when he speaks, that's because he's also a frequent interviewee on channels you may listen to, like NPR, PBS, the BBC, See, and if his words look familiar to you when you see them on the page, that's because he is also a frequent go-to source for people from the New York Times, the Washington Post, Time Magazine, and so on. So um, he will now start us off for this panel session. Thank you very much, Andrea. And I'm going to stand up at the podium. Um, thank you, organizers, Danny and uh, Nader. We were very broken hearted at Oklahoma because we interviewed Nader the same year that he interviewed here and we tried to get him. And uh, he liked the beauty and the money of Denver more. <laughs> so we were broken hearted. But um, at any rate, it's great to be invited here. So I feel like there's a bonus prize at the end of this consolation. <laughs> um, at any rate, thanks to everybody here. It's been a delightful. Uh, fun time to visit such a vibrant center. Um, let me, I'm going to break this talk into three little parts. One is trying to put it in a larger context of the Levant. Long and bloody is going to be the sort of subtitle here. Why is it so long and bloody? And there's a model, I think, that will explain this in the whole Levant, because the Levant Every one of the regimes, really, in the Levant was a minoritarian regime. And transforming that away from the minority has been long and bloody. Um, and I think that Syria fits into this model. Then I'm going to talk about how to think about the future. And there are three models I will review. The Turkish model of revolution in Turkey and how the Turks came through their revolution and built a nation the Iraqi model and the Lebanese model, and how those reflect, you know, how we can use those to think about what's going on in Syria. Are they comparative or are they not comparative? And then I would end with a little discussion of the possibilities or not possibilities of an Alawite region um, enclave on the coast. Is it likely, unlikely? And that's where I will leave it. So let me start with the larger historical context, the long and bloody. 
The Levant, of course, is so different from North Africa. In North Africa, the, there's much more homogeneous population. And the Levant states are deeply divided and weak, deeply divided by sect and ethnicity. And the Europeans, after destroying the Ottoman Empire, drew rather haphazard borders for their own reasons and stuck peoples of different ethnic and religious background together, peoples who often didn't necessarily want to be together, like the Kurds and the Arabs, or the Alawites and the Muslims. I mean, we have to remember that Suleiman al-Assad, the grandfather of Bashar, petitioned the French in 1936 to be, for the whole Alawite region, which was a separate state under the French or state lit, to be part of Lebanon and to make it part of Lebanon. The French couldn't do that for the Alawites, but it's sort of ironic because we're coming full circle here. Um, at any rate, the international community expected all these peoples to just find a way to get along. And they have not, by and large, found a way to get along in the Levant. And the colonial powers, in order to cement their rule in all these Levant states, gave a boost up to the minorities. And we see that with the Maronites getting the lion's share of power in Lebanon. And there was civil war for 15 years, 1975 to 90, when the Muslims rose up and threw down, cast out the Maronites from this, mon not monopoly completely, but the lion's share of power. And it was long and bloody. About 150, 200,000 dead, uh, a million refugees out of a country of three million. So it was a big, long, and bloody, and it's still a dysfunctional state this consociational mishmash, uh, there, is a, you know, there is a dysfunctional state in Lebanon and uh, the three different sects look at each other across a big cultural divide. Iraq, the Sunnis left in power by the British, 20% over the 60% Shiites and 20% Kurds. Now, America cast them down and by destroying Saddam's regime, threw them to the bottom of society and catapulted the Shiites to the top. But it's long and bloody. The Sunnis did not like being displaced and thrown down to the bottom. And they fought back, Al-Qaeda and all of the other groups. And still, it's not over. Every day in Baghdad and in Iraq, there are car bombs going off and the death rate is usually 35, 50, some days over 100. Um, because the Sunnis are on the warpath. They do not like being excluded. And the little bit of power sharing that America left when it departed is now being completely undone by Maliki, who's casting out the Sunnis even more, and it's causing great protest. Long and bloody. Because these minorities see this as a zero-sum game. When they're cast out, they're not <clears> going <throat> to get a hunk. There's not power sharing. There's, a dis there's not an ability to work out a common constitution. We can even fit Palestine, Israel, into this model. The Jewish minority, which was about 15% in the First World War, the British, with the Balfour Declaration, gave them a boost up, 33% by the time the British left in 48. Now, the Muslims, the Palestinian Christians and Muslims, thought that they could make short work of the Jews and that they would be the dominant group in Palestine. Of course, they were wrong. They were defeated. And the Jews, some 800,000 fled and, and, uh, and others stayed behind. But the Jews were able to solve their problem, in a sense, by turning themselves from a minority into the majority, in gathering Jews from around the world who had been persecuted, and making life very miserable for Palestinians so that they would leave. And in a sense, the Jews have won. I don't think the Palestinians hold out much hope for a state. Maybe they do. Um, most say they don't anymore. But it's been long and bloody. The Palestinians still don't like being excluded and thrown down. They are fighting to get a hunk of that state, which they probably won't get. This leaves, brings us to Syria. <coughs> Of course, the French, as we heard earlier on, uh, privileged 
the, the Alawites, as they did to all the minorities, because when they landed in Syria, there was a nationalist uprising that was led in, not, in no small part by the Sunnis of the cities. And they recruited urban, or I mean, rural Sunnis from the countryside, but largely minorities. And the Alawites, who had been at the bottom of Syrian society, of course, streamed into the military, where they could get three square meals and a uniform and be, walk around with a gun and frighten people, which was a big change for them. Um, and it's, it's important to remember how excluded the Alawites had been under, in Syrian society before the French arrived in 1920. There was a stark demographic segregation. In no town of over 200 people did Alawites and Sunnis lived together in Syria in 1920, with the first censuses that the French did. The coastal cities of Latakia, Jebli, Banyas, Tartus were Sunni cities with Christian minorities. Now there were maids and servants who were there who were Alawite, but they didn't live in those cities. Uh, they came from the villages. There were villages inside the Alawite mountains on the coast that were shared by Christians and Alawites Ismailis, Alawites, and so forth, but not Sunnis and Alawites. Very stark. An Alawite could not give testimony in a court of law, officially, because they were considered to be liars, because they're not people of the book. They're not Jews, Christians, or Muslims who are the only recognized, officially recognized people who could give testimony in a court of law. Sometimes they were able to. We, we've found from Sharia court records, but it was the big exception because they were hulu and they didn't believe, they didn't have a holy <clears throat> books that were descended from God. So how could you swear on them and why would you tell the truth if you don't fear God? Um, and this is a problem for the Alawites and it remains a problem. And we just heard that the Minister of Education in, in Egypt four days ago said that the Baha'is could not go to public school because they weren't people of the book. The Alawites are Baha'is, in a sense, because they're not part of the revealed religion, traditionally. Now, those problems were partially solved, of course, the Alawite problems. Uh, but they were solved in part because the Alawites took power and they enforced secularism on Syria, which wasn't real secularism, as we know. Um, OK, let me not the labor at that point, but the Alawites were clearly very vigilant. By 1955, it was estimated that about 60% of the non-commissioned officers in the Syrian army were Alawites. A series of coups, by 1966, the Alawites had risen up the ranks. They took power for themselves with the uh, Salah Hajdid's coup, and Syria has been led by an Alawite ever since. Assad took power in 70, the families fought amongst each other, the Alawite families, but since 70, the Alawites have ruled. And they stacked the military upper ranks and the Muqabadat with Alawites. Estimations, which are wildly inaccurate, are about 60 to 70% of the officer corps was Alawite. We don't know if that's true because nobody, nobody does statistics on who's who in the upper ranks of the military. Um, but these are guesses, and the fact that they're, you know, they could be right, they could be off by 10, 15, 20 percent, but the, the fact is, is that the Alawites were very conscious that they needed to hold power. And Assad's were preparing for this day of revolt for 40 years. They didn't let their children go off into international banking, as Mubarak did, or the head of Tunisia. They sent their children to military training, because that's what they would need to cling on to power. So they were prepared. As we heard from Stephen, they were prepared, but of course they were surprised. They thought they had intimidated people to the point where they would not rise up. But this is the long and bloody model. Getting rid of the Alawites from the pinnacle of rule is going to be hard. It's going to be hard because they see it as an existential question. And. Um, in the same way that the Palestinians do, the Christians of Lebanon did, the Sunnis of Iraq did. And all of those people dragged, I mean the Maronites dragged their country into a brutal civil war for many, many years. 
as Fuad Ajami said, well, at least the Lebanese were lucky to have the Maronites because they were well educated. Um, and that's true. But it doesn't obviate the fact that they're minorities who see a zero sum game for themselves. So let me turn then to the three different models of endgame. The Turkish model. It's the model of ethnic cleansing. Turkey, in 1914, was almost 20% Christian, 18% by the best bad demographics. By 1922, the end of the revolution, Turkish revolution, when the Greeks were expelled, um, less than 1% Christians. The Armenians, of course, we know what happened to them. Uh, many killed, the others driven out. They were accused, of course, of being traitors who sided with the Russians during the First World War. The Greek Orthodox were driven out through population exchange. A million and a half were sent to Greece. One out of every four Greeks is descended from an Anatolian. Um, and half a million Muslims were sent from Greece to Turkey. But many of those Christians fled to Syria. Aleppo, big proportion of the Aleppo and Christian population, our descendants have already lost one country in the last hundred years, and it's partly why they cling to this regime. They have this sort of Masada complex, if you will. So now Turkey, I'm not recommending ethnic cleansing. <laughs> but it does solve a national problem. <clears throat> of course, there's still Kurds in Turkey. But it solves it in a sense that if you make, you could make the argument that the democratic transition that Erdogan has taken his country through in the last eight, 10 years is only successful because there were no Christians. If there had been a voting bloc of 20% Christians in Turkey, they would have all voted for the Kamalists, the seculars, and the generals to hang on to power. They would have seen Erdogan as Khomeini coming to spread headscarves and make their women wear headscarves. And they would have been fearful. And that's exactly the way the minorities are in Syria. They would have been like the Syrian minorities, which would have crashed any kind of democratic or transition or soft landing and caused a national crisis. You could argue that. I don't know if it's true. Maybe Anatolian Christians would be different. But they would be fearful. That didn't happen. Erdogan could get the majority of the vote, 50-something percent, because there wasn't 20 percent Christians in Anatolia. OK. That's the, I don't think Syria is going to be like Turkey. There's no Ataturk. There's no unified nationalist movement in Syria that would make it easy to sweep into the Alawite areas and scare them away, for example, or do population exchange or something like that. Um, Iraq. I think most people expected the Syrian revolution to go the way of Iraq, that the Assad regime would fall rather precipitously, like Egypt and so forth, like Saddam Hussein's regime that went down in three weeks that the Sunnis would gather together, unite, and that they would supplant it. And that you would get this sort of quick, fairly quick you know, transformation where the Alawites would go down and the Sunnis would come up in the same way that the Sunnis in Iraq went down and the Shiites came up. The big difference, though, and the reason that doesn't happen, in part, is because there's no boots on the ground. It's the Americans that carried out that transformation in Iraq. Not only did the Americans destroy Saddam's army in three short weeks, but they debathified and then they went after the rebels and all the Sunni groups that began to shoot at them and they killed them. But most importantly, they suppressed any competitive Shiite militias in nurturing Maliki and this new Shiite dominated state. They destroyed, that didn't destroy, but they, they, they uh, quelled any possible competitors, whether it was Skiri or Southernist movement or so forth, who would have made Maliki's life and who did try to challenge Maliki. So America nurtured for eight years a new alternative government 
with a security system and an army, and they trained them, and they gave them billions of dollars, and they, they worked it. As soon as they had something they thought was stable, they were out of there. Now they felt badly, and they tried to make some power sharing and, and reincorporate the sons of Iraq back into the military. But Maliki, you know, within minutes of American departure, got rid of all that. And you've got, you know, a dictatorship of the Shiite majority now ruling over unhappy minorities. But that's due to the American army. There is no boots on the ground. There's no American army in Iraq and in Syria. And so you're not getting the destruction of Assad's army in three short weeks. And you're not getting a unified nationalist movement. There's nobody who's going to put down Jabhat al-Nusra and others as you know, some middle of the road militia reaches for consolidating. This leaves you with a Lebanon model, which is lots of militias who can't beat each other, who will fight for a long time. Lebanon model was 15 years, right? 200,000 people dead. And then in the end, because no one group could impose itself on the others, you had the Taif Accords where America, Syria, Saudi Arabia dragged the last living parliamentarians of Lebanon, there were 76 or something out of 100 who were still alive down to Taif, and they made them agree on a power sharing formula. And then warlords like Jumblat and Jaja and so forth, who had all been killing 20, 30,000 of each other's people, could kiss, hug each other, and make up. And they're still there doing the Lebanon thing. Now, obviously, that's Assad's dream, right? Is that, I mean, he still thinks he's going to hold on to Damascus and somehow bring this around. Uh, but I'm sure there are plenty of Alawites who understand that's not going to happen. But they, what's their best case scenario? Their best case scenario is they get driven out of Damascus after a long, now of course they have to destroy Damascus. Because if you allow the rebels to take Damascus whole, Damascus is the goose that lays the golden egg in Syria. It is Syria. It's got all the money. It's got all the people. If you just hand that over to the opposition, they're going to come and kill you because they're going to have money and people. So you have to lay waste to Damascus the same way you laid waste to Aleppo and uh, make sure that it's a burden on the rebels, that they can't feed themselves, that they're going to be so preoccupied in trying to just find homes for people in Damascus that they're not going to be able to marshal up and go over to the Alawite mountains and kill Alawites. That's what the Alawites are going to fear. So there is this, you know, this scorched earth policy going on, and that's what Assad is doing. He did it to Aleppo, and now he's doing it to Damascus. Because if he has to fall back, he needs to have the rebels having no ammunition, having no advantages. Because he's not going to have a lot in the Alawite Mountains. Anybody who's traveled around the Alawite Mountains knows that there's not much in the Alawite Mountains, except for rocks and some trees. I mean, there's... There is some agriculture there, but it's not a base for a big, booming economy. Um, can an Alawite state survive? Obviously, there's two major variables. One is do the Sunni Arabs, who are 70% of Syria, unite? If they unite, there's nothing the Alawites can do. They're finished. Because the Alawites are only 12%. That's about 2.5 million people. Now, they're still lethal. Somebody had asked, you know, about this Alawite army. 2.5 million people. Half of them are men. That's 1.2 million. And the median age of a Syrian is 21 years old. So more than half of those Alawites are of military age. And most of them have been through military service. Many of them have, and many of them have been officers. And they've got central command and control. They're a big potential army. Even once all the Sunnis have left, and this, this army is becoming a, a, a Shiite militia, I mean, an Alawite militia, it hasn't become that completely. There are still Sunnis who are out there shooting and fighting. They're not all hiding in, in their home bases. There are still Sunnis killing people because they, they own Damascus. They own big hunks of Sunni territory, and these people can't defect easily. But once they lose Damascus, the Sunnis are not going to go to the Alawite territory with the Alawites. They're going to leave the army, and then it'll be just in a Shiite militia, and it'll be like Hezbollah. 
That's the best case scenario for the Alawites, is to continue to get Iranian support. And all that will depend on Iranian support. If you get Iranian support and possible Russian support, you could maintain a militia in the Alawite territories. But of course, the Sunni Arabs have to be divided and fighting amongst themselves. That's going to be key. That's the Lebanon model. If they don't, they're going to overwhelm you. The Alawites are counting on Assad. The question of you know, what you asked, Red One, of when does Assad go, right? What, is he, what does Chris Hill mean by when Assad has to go? Assad's not going to go. He's going to have to be killed. But he's, he's, I, I don't see any way to get the Alawite community to turn against Assad. Assad has eliminated any competitors within the Alawite. There is no civil society in the Alawite community. There's no even priestly class, really, who have any power. There are no schools of theology. There's no, there are no alternative sources of power to the Assad regime and uh, the Shabiha. And as you said, it's the Assad family. The Shabiha are all cousins of Assad. You can't get them to turn again, away against him because they're all part of it. And the American administration for 10 years has been talking about getting the adult Alawites to turn against the children or the, the bad Alawites. And uh, they have never done it. They haven't done it because they can't. And more than that, they're frightened. Because if they sacrifice the Assads, the whole regime is built around the Assad family and a loyalty to the person and the family. If you get rid of them, the whole structure crumbles. And the Alawites will just be vulnerable in front of these 1,000-something militias that inhabit Syria today. And many of them will be responsible and they'll say, no, we want you to be part of our country. But some of them won't. Some of them will say, there's lots of good stuff they stole from the regime up in those villages. Let's go find it. I want a house. But mostly importantly, if there are six Alawite villages north of Latakia that have been overrun by Turkmen and some foreign fighter militias. There's not an Alawite left in any of those villages. They didn't hang around to see what would happen to them once the militias took over. Like the Palestinians fleeing in front of the Jews in 1948, or the Christians fleeing, the Armenians fleeing in front of the Turks and the Kurds in 1915. They weren't going to find out whether people were going to be merciful and have them with the court and say, did you kill anybody with blood on your hands or not? They left. And that's a possibility for the Alawites is to go to Lebanon. They would just crash the border and go down there, I suppose. That's what I would do if I were an Alawite. If things began to really fall apart, I wouldn't wait in my village for some militia to come around the corner. So that's the, that's the dilemma is how do you make this end game work and get rid of Assad? Because it'll be very hard for any Sunni new government or new militias to make a deal with Assad. It's impossible to make a deal with Assad. But how do you get rid of them without destroying the Alawite military entirely? And that's going to be the dilemma. And America is going to be stuck because you know, just the other week, I was having a debate with Michael Duran and a lot of people from, from the Brookings Institute. And they said, you cannot leave a potential Hezbollah in the Alawite enclave. This would be reproducing Hezbollah. And America, that's the, it's against America's interests. This is Iranian influence. We're not going to leave Iranian influence at the end of this war. The whole point is to get rid of Iranian influence. But then you have to weigh that against, you know, you heard Christopher Hill talking about, well, the only solution is a political solution. You've got to have a negotiated settlement. In other words, Alawites have to talk to Sunnis, have to talk to this and the Kurds, and they have to come together and agree on a sort of a Taif Accord, right? The Lebanon solution. Sunni Arabs in Syria do not want a Taif Accord. They don't want to be like Lebanon. They hate the Lebanese system. They see it as a point of weakness, and you'll be a penetrated state forever, and you will not, or it'd be a whole nation. At any rate, who's going to make a deal with outside in this whole security system over there? You can't make that deal. Who's going to let the Kurdish territories have this great autonomy and perhaps independence? This is the dilemma as we face into the end game, is how do you 
you know, America's pushing for that negotiated agreement, and they're beginning to talk like Russians. And, uh, and the Syrians are furious, the Syrian Sydney Arabs, because they want to defeat these people. This is like Hitler. For them, they want a total surrender. But to get that total surrender is going to mean a lot. Long, bloody battle. Long and bloody. Because the Alawites feel it in their bones. And they're frightened of it. And they're going to fight like the Dickens. Not to let that happen to them. On that cheerful note, <laughs> that's the dilemma I see. And so I think a lot of this end game talk about how do we negotiate a nice solution. I don't see a negotiated solution because there's not a unified Arab army that you can negotiate with. You can have nice people from America reassure Alawites that they'll be taken care of. That, that, that means meaningless. Um, it's very difficult to get. You know, to, to, to. Any rate, I've left you with the way I think about this. And uh, thank you very much. Okay, so I admit that when Josh started out by saying that, well, we're really going to have to rule out ethnic cleansing here as an option, and then we're also going to have to rule out a U.S. invasion, I thought, oh, well, this is actually kind of looking up here, but um, he's managed to take it right back down, um, <laughs> and I think um, we'll have a lot of food for thought, and I think this actually will make for a very, very interesting discussion afterwards. So let me turn to our ray of sunshine, um, <laughs> who I don't actually know quite as well, so I'm going to have to be a little more... <clears throat> formal in my introduction. Rafif Joyjati is the English spokeswoman for the local coordinating committees in Syria, who, uh, which, if um, you have been here for some of the earlier panels, have come up a number of times. And I think a lot of us are very interested to hear more. Um, for those of you who don't know, they're in, in a network of activists throughout the country. And she said just before that there are 80, um, if you're curious to the number. She's also the director of Free Syria, which is a nonprofit humanitarian organization that focuses on women's empowerment. And she's a member of the Day After Project, which is developing a transition plan for the country in which I hope she'll speak more about um, now. Um, she also, again, back to my earlier statements, if her name looks familiar to you and her words look familiar to you, she has also been in the New York Times as a writer. She's been in Waging Nonviolence, and she has been interviewed on Charlie Rose, on Democracy Now!, and other programs. So it's also a great pleasure to have her here. And she will now speak to us on her, her assessment of the situation and possible scenarios. Thank you, Andrea. Uh, I want to start by thanking the Center for Middle East Studies for hosting us. Oh, she's, uh, we're, we're she's gonna not going to take the podium. Discussion. We, we sorted but, it out with but the But Danny, I did want to thank you. I wanted to thank Nader and, of course, Doug for putting this together. And I want to pick up where Josh left off. He said, negotiation with Assad. And I'd like to give you a quote from another opposition person. The only negotiation with Assad is the size and the length of the rope that hangs him. So this is our position on uh, negotiations with Assad. Now, we've spoken about the day after. We've spoken about the LCCs. I'd like to give you a little bit more information about the local coordination committees in Syria, if you're not familiar with them. They are among the largest grassroots organizations in Syria. They now have 80 committees across the country. And originally, we began with the task of issuing reports about violations, about deaths, the daily death toll. You may see us quoted in CNN or on Al Jazeera. These are our numbers. We moved quickly from a media role into one of documentation of crimes against humanity, and now we maintain a fairly well often cited database under the um, Violations Documentation Center. We moved quickly from doing that to now distributing humanitarian relief across the country, across communities. You may have heard about us for staging the strikes for dignity, the strikes for freedom, and the strikes for democracy for all Syrians. There's been a lot of talk about sectarianism, and there's been a lot of classification of people, whether they are Sunni Arabs, Kurdish Arabs, Christians, Alawis. The LCC has consistently maintained a position that we are all Syrian. As we have put on our demonstrations, we've been very fortunate to have Alawi activists within the Syria Tel network, the cell phone company, uh, hack into the systems and let us know what the regime was communicating among each other. 
We've been very fortunate as we distribute relief across the country to know that the largest donors inside Syria are Christian and Alawi families. We've been very fortunate. We've been very fortunate to successfully schedule Wednesday demonstrations of I am Syrian, I am Alawi, I am Sunni, I am Kurdish, I am Christian, I am Ismaili, I am Druze. These are dedicated Wednesdays to show that we are all Syrian. So this is why I do not fear the kind of Sunni Arab takeover. This is why I do not fear the Islamists. We worry about the, the Islamists are coming and we know they are there and we know they're working hard, but we also know that this is the revolution for freedom, dignity, and democracy for all Syrians. And we are very committed to that. As part of our ongoing work, uh, Andrea mentioned I'm part of the Day After Project. If you're not familiar with that, I'd like to talk about it a little bit. This is a transitional framework for the post-Assad Syria. Uh, we gathered some 45 Syrian opposition activists from inside Syria and abroad. Uh, 45 Syrians who had constituencies back home so that this could be disseminated more in Syria. And we covered areas of transitional justice, rule of law, constitution making, uh, economic restructuring and social policy and electoral systems analysis. And we put together a series of recommendations for the future transitional government. We included representatives from the Muslim Brotherhood. We had Christian representatives. We had representatives from the Kurdish National Council. We had secularists like myself, people from the LCC, people from the Syrian Revolution General Commission, another very large network of activists. So I, I think we had a broad range of, Syri of Syrians, and Radwan Ziade participated a little bit with us in putting together these recommendations. Today, we've moved beyond phase one of pulling together the recommendations, and we have formed an NGO in Istanbul, and we are conducting workshops every week on our subjects. We're bringing in Syrians from Syria to participate in these workshops and to then go and train other Syrians. Our first priority has been transitional justice. Our first attendees have been clerics, Alawis, Christians, Druze, Sunnis. We're inclusive. We're trying to disseminate the message of peace, the message of being Syrian first before any sort of sectarian or ethnic identity. This, to me, is extremely positive. But we're doing a little bit more than just the, trans just the day after project. Groups inside Syria and abroad are now forming ci civil society organizations. I just came back from Istanbul, L literally I arrived yesterday from Istanbul, and there is now a call among Syrians, if you have formed an NGO abroad, bring it to Syria. And so next month we'll be starting the process of launching five centers for civil society throughout Syria. We're gonna start in the liberated zones and move throughout the country. Training, training, and training education, transitional justice, national identity versus sectarian identity. The reception I am seeing from Syrian activists on the ground is overwhelming, overwhelming. I think what's been absent in today's discussions has been the voice of the activist. We're looking at things very academically. We're looking at things from a geopolitical strategic perspective and we're forgetting the people who have made this revolution possible and who continue it every day. We're focusing on the Islamist groups, we're focusing on Jabhat al-Nusra and the militarization of the revolution, but we are discounting the fact that every day there are peaceful demonstrations throughout Syria. On Fridays, we document hundreds of peaceful demonstrations. And if those activists who are Christian and Sunni, and Alawi in many cases, and Druze, can go out in peaceful demonstration, it means that they have optimism and hope for the future. And it means they're not running away from the villages. It means they're holding fast to the principle that this is the revolution, again, for dignity, freedom, and democracy for all. 
Now I know the transition is not going to be rosy-eyed and sweet. It may be long and bloody. It, it will be bloody for sure. I think there are a lot of ifs associated with the transition. If we can continue to educate about transitional justice, we can make it. If we can bring these civil society organizations into Syria, we will make it. If we can continue to support the Free Syrian Army, which has signed up to a code of conduct presented by the local coordination committees. Uh, the code of conduct is based on the Geneva Conventions and International Laws. If we can continue to disseminate that code of conduct, we will be all right. If we continue to have Alawi and Christian collaborators from across the country feed us intelligence and work with us to create more campaigns, we will be all right. But we also need to support the opposition. The Syrian Opposition Coalition, I think, is making some good progress. They need to be encouraged. They are being encouraged. I think they need to communicate more frequently with the Syrian public on the ground. I think they need to show that they are an accountable body now that they have been called the legitimate representative of the Syrian people. They have a magnificent responsibility towards us. I think as we appoint ambassadors, and incidentally our first ambassador was an Alawi, um, as we appoint more ambassadors and other diplomats, we need to start retaking our embassies. We need to begin the legal process to do that. Uh, but above all, we need to communicate with the Syrian people and continue relief efforts because he who feeds the person is the victor. And we know that today, many, many groups are trying to feed many, many people and the aid is not always getting there. What is getting there is from the more dangerous elements and so we're countering. If we can push the coalition, if we can continue to support the LCC and other secular organizations in delivering this assistance, I think we will make it. I do want to say, I'm going to be brief because I think we need to have a, a discussion um, about things. I, I realize that what dominates the news is really the uh, clashes with rebel forces. They're called rebels because that's really sexy and that sells newspapers and that gets more clicks online. And we talked about the Islamists because that too is sexy and we call it a civil war, which is very sexy because then we can sort of walk away. We can put. Syrians into a neat little box of being over there in their civil war. Uh, from an LCC perspective, this is not a civil war. This is a case of a regime firing on its own population. This is a regime guilty of using sexualized torture against civilians. This is a regime, as Adwan explained today, guilty of dropping TNT-filled barrel bombs on bread lines. It is not a civil war. So I do want to impress upon you that the civil resistance movement is alive and well. We are planning in the coming weeks more pushes for additional campaigns. I think you can hopefully see in the media news about uh, protests and campaigns and civil society movements and cross-ethnic, cross-sectarian, cross-cultural uh, modes of cooperation, similar to what we saw last Ramadan when priests were cooking dinner for fasting Muslims, or when Alawis were distributing medical supplies across communities. Uh, because I know this is happening, because it continues to happen, and because people continue to go out in peaceful demonstration, I say that Syrians on the ground have hope. And since they do, who are we to be pessimistic? Who are we to deny them that hope? Thank you. Okay, well, thank you both very much. I think there's a tremendous amount of material to speak about here. I think that <clears throat> um, one thing that when, Rafif, you speak about civil resistance, I think about um, the last <clears throat> summer I lived in 
Syria, which was 2006, and when the government shut down civil society efforts to help refugees coming from Lebanon during the 2006 war. And what you're talking about is a world apart in terms of self-governance and self-organization. Mm -hmm. And I think that <clears throat> in and of itself, for those of you who are less familiar with kind of domestic life in, in, in Syria is, is a change. Um, I also think that, um, that I think I have four minutes to speak on this, so I'll be brief. Um, <clears throat> I also think that your comments collectively touch in many ways and in different aspects on some of the comments and some of the questions that have come up in the earlier panels. And so I thought perhaps I would just go through them and then ask you to expand on whichever, if any, aspect of that you find interesting. And then I think the most important thing is we'll open the floor for questions and maybe even more than that, a more kind of robust discussion. Um, but I, I think that um, since sort of if you spoke last, I'll start with you. Um, one, one comment that the moderator last night, Tamara Pearson Destre, said was that there, there is a need, and I think that um, you referenced it in Yabrud, which is where I'm thinking of, where there were um, <clears throat> a church that hosted a, an iftar, um, the, the need for alternative models that are positive models, that are local scale, and that, they're, that we see as, as kind of something that's working on the ground, that other people that are concrete, that are not rhetorical, that are not invocations of unity, but that are actual concrete, simple examples for what in other contexts we would talk about as trust building um, <clears throat> or even capacity building and I think that that's that's quite important to think about um, <clears throat> you've addressed this I think in in some ways um, in your overall <laughs> mission of um, avocation and vocation but one other question that Tamara raised was the question of what role if any should be or is envisioned for members of the Assad regime. So we've talked more particularly in this last panel about the military. I think there's still plenty of space to talk about the military and what is, however we define the military, the 4th Battalion or whatever else is active. Um, but this question of <clears throat> who is in the regime on Josh's um, reference to the Iraq model, is there going to be a, a de-regimification and where does that extend? Does that extend down to the people at the commercial bank, let's say? Um, <clears throat> And I think that that is something to consider, and that's something that's come up in, in previous panels as well. Um, last night, Kristen said that, if I remember the quote correctly, that she doesn't see Syria as fitting any particular other model. And I wrote it down as Syria isn't like anything else in the region. And I think, um, uh, <clears throat> as a historian, you know, of course, we call for specificity sometimes to the counting cotton um, level. <clears throat> but I, I wonder, Josh, whether that I find your models both compelling and traumatizing. Um, but I also wonder whether <clears throat> there is something about the specificity of Syria that we're overlooking if we're assuming that there are other models. Um, so maybe um, if we could just leave it at that with the one final comment, which is that um, as someone who has spent several years living <clears throat> part of the year in, in Syria, the depiction of Syrians, and we were just speaking about this before, that we see now as these people who are desperately incapable of doing anything other than being in a flooded refugee camp and um, the invocation of pity that is required to <clears throat> motivate people to send humanitarian aid. The aid is very much needed, but it, it troubles me, and as someone who also lived in Lebanon, it disheartens me to think that the depiction of Syrians going forward may be some form of people in perpetual distress in the way that we saw for a long time people in Lebanon being portrayed in that way. So <clears throat> maybe just a couple of comments from each of you and any aspect of that that you find interesting or some sure. other aspect that you find interesting and then we'll open the floor. Sure, sure. Uh, regarding the debathification of Syria, uh, many of us would like to do that, but of course we have lessons learned from Iraq, which is another reason why we are not Iraq. We have lessons learned from Lebanon, which is why I argue that we are not Lebanon. Uh, but in the day after a document, we make specific recommendations to not debathify the country. In fact, we want to try to keep some institutions going because we have to keep the lights on. What we do want to do is begin the process of prosecuting those who have blood on their hands uh, through proof, through uh, an independent court. Uh, so that people have due process. People who are guilty of crimes against humanity, of course, are going to be prosecuted. Uh, those who are simple functionaries who were doing their day-to-day -day jobs and had nothing to do with killing, of course, are welcome to stay. In fact, we need them to stay so that we can keep our institutions going. This would apply to things like the central bank, other uh, ministries. Um, Part of the role of the opposition coalition and the transitional government will be to appoint 
ministers and other government representatives and see how they work with their peers and colleagues internally. Uh, so I think that answers your question there. One thing I would like to talk about, well, you said the appearance of refugees. Um, my organization is helping to fund a camp inside the Syrian borders in Atme. And we've had some challenges in getting tents put up, uh, and we've had some successes. I, I'm very, very proud to, to report to you that some of the women from the camp have contacted us and they said, we want to set up a council, we want to vote, we want to lead this because the men are not doing enough. Um, put, put matters in our hands. And so we are now going to open a community center in Atme and start training women specifically to take on more of a leadership role in this. And this is something I think we could discuss. Um, boy. I can go on for longer if the, you want another the, moment. You know, I, I, I like to, the court situation, debatification. First of all, in debatification, I, I think I think that the uh, the debatification is going to be pretty thorough, and so is the destruction of national institutions. Why? Because Assad corrupted most national institutions so thoroughly by putting people who are loyal to him. Meritoc Syria is not a meritocracy. Syria is about loyalty to the man and the family. And in order to undo that loyalty, you're going to have to strip down most of those institutions and get rid of people. I can use my own family, my wife's family, as an, as an example. Both sides of her, both of her parents are one of ten children. Her mother's side, one of six girls, all of them became teachers. Some of them are teachers of English, and I've spoken English with a few of them. I think they know five words. And, no, I'm exaggerating. But they're not qualified English teachers. The only excuse, the only rationale I can come up with for why they got to be English teachers is because of WASTA. And they're all getting vitamin well. There you go, vitamin WASTA. It's, uh, it's connections. And this is the problem with a Syrian bureaucracy. And it's the oil industry. It's the education ministry. It's every innocent ministry that you would think. It's about loyalty to the man. When the rebels take over, they're going to have an army of unemployed people who've got dead relatives who've sacrificed everything in their lives for this revolution. They're not going to let a bunch of elderly Alawite women continue teaching. It's just not going to happen. They're all going to be fired. And this army of unemployed people who would desperately need jobs are going to be put into those positions. And it's going to happen from one end of Syria to the other. If there's institutions that are left, I mean, you talked about keeping the lights on. There are hardly any lights to be kept on in Syria. Mm -hmm. the, the, this is the, it's the ruin is, I mean, I'm, I don't want to belabor it, but I think the debathification is going to be pretty profound, both in the military. The military is the most important in, in national institution, and that is going to have to be dismantled from top to bottom. Um, let me counter that. When you have the prime minister defecting, when you have the presidential spokesperson defecting, when you other, have other high-ranking officials defecting, it tells you that the loyalty does not go all the way to the top. Uh, we know that the Prime Minister defected with 40 family members. The day he was being sworn in by Bashar al-Assad, he already had plans underway to defect. So we, uh, we know of other senior officials who, whose defections are in the works. So I, I want to counter you on that high... Uh, um, so many of these senior officials were met with a barrage of criticism and insult. You look at Facebook amongst all the activist communities. When these guys tr thought, oh, I'm going to defect and just become part of the new government, there was, there was, you know, when Klaus goes out and thinks he's going to go to France and become a leader of the opposition, everybody was ripping him another one. I mean, it was just, it was, people were so angry at the notion that somebody who's lived off the fat of the land for 40 years being part of this corrupt administration is going to waltz over and become part of the, the new government. It's not going to happen that way. And I know it'd be nice to think that there's going to be harmony and that there's going to be reintegration. It's going to be easy, but it's going to be very, very difficult. I think it's going to be extremely difficult. I mean, 40 years of real brutality and 
and corruption is hard to get over. And the way this regime has proceeded, if the regime had, you know, if Assad had made some transition, perhaps, but he didn't. He's going to destroy this country, and, it, and the, the anger is going to be, you know, I, I can't say they deserve it, but it's going to be very hard, I think, to find some kind of reconciliation. Yes, we didn't say it would be easy. Um, with regard to the security sector, uh, one of, among our recommendations are that we dismantle the mukhabarat, but not the security sector. That we seek ways to reintegrate soldiers into a national army, but dismantle those reviled shabiha blood and on the your hands. But hold on, hold on, hold on. Not all of them have blood on their hands. Uh, another thing. What? I'm just. I'm being <laughs> facetious here. Maybe three of them don't. I don't know. Um, no, I don't think that's true because you have at least 80,000 soldiers who have been restricted to barracks because of fear of defections. You have other soldiers, you, you have to make a determination. You have other soldiers who have chosen to fire into the air rather than hit civilian targets. You have pilots who have chosen to drop the payload in empty fields rather than hit residential communities. You do have those people and we need to take advantage of them and we need to bring them back into a new government. Uh, with regard to the wasta, absolutely. We all know that in Syria you live by vitamin wasta. It's who you know and what connections you have, and this is one of the reasons why the revolution started. It is because people want to do away with those. Uh, we have lots of unqualified teachers. They're not all Alawi. No. <laughs> don't be dissing no, no, the I'm bad sorry, Alawi I, teachers. I, I we have my, my, plenty my, my of underqualified smart, Sunni teachers. teachers. <laughs> no. <laughs> I think if I could just jump in here, I think that, I mean, I think what I hear too, I mean, I'd actually just like to hear you go at it all night, but, um, <laughs> but, but I, I, because I, I think you're, you're both bringing up extremely sincere and well-reasoned arguments that go right at the heart of what some of these challenges are. I also think that I, I hear kind of two strands coming from that, and one is the challenge of, of great expectations, which is I think what, what Josh is talking about the, <clears throat> for the, the hordes of unemployed who have supported the revolution and, and want that afterwards. And I think that we've seen that play out in other countries recently, particularly in Egypt. People who have huge expectations of what will happen, what will their sacrifices be worth, and what their sacrifices are worth immediately is a shattered economy and shattered institutions and, 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 and little, um, a, a long process ahead of rebuilding. And I think that's the other part of it. I mean, when I think of the day after, what I also think about is what about the year after and two years mm -hmm. after and 10 years after? And I think that that's um, in some ways what I, I see as the, the larger challenge, the day after there may be nothing or there, or there may be a disaster and it's <clears throat> what, is, what is the 10 year plan? And mm -hmm. I mean that in a non-Bathist way, um, but also how is it that um, how is that plan will be developed and who will have consensus and how will you persuade people to have the patience to wait it out for 10 years and to suspend judgment or to spend desire for revenge or suspend a desperate need for the perfect job and I think and and also the the 10 years for education and what might be lost I mean I think you've hit several times on the importance of education and um, I, I think say a word about yeah. about the courts you know when I read the the day after project that USIP put together, Stephen oh. Heidemann and others put together. And one of the, you know, it was a big US government sponsored day after, how can we smooth the transition? And I read that paragraph about justice and about how everybody with blood on their hands would go to court and be prosecuted. And I think of how many people in that regime have got blood on their hands. It's not all, it's probably a lot less than we think, but it's a lot. And they all come from big families and villages. It's going to be so hard without some kind of amnesty to get a negotiated solution. And I think that's what Christopher Hill was pointing at earlier, is that ultimately you're going to have to have some kind of negotiations. And if you hold these things like we're going to prosecute everybody, you know, everybody who doesn't have blood in their hands is okay. You're not going to get those negotiations because it's going to it's going to infect every family in the Alawite community and many other communities. It's going to be very frightening for people if that kind of justice. And I know, you know, I know that there are these different organizations that are, you know, keeping big catalogs now, and we've got good computers and all this video to try to catalog all the crimes against humanity. And I guess the State Department is paying for a lot of this. Um, 
but it's going to create a it's going to create a bureaucracy of legal red tape that's going to be very hard to undo when it comes time to negotiate. And uh, you have to admire the desire for justice, but at the same time, it's going to make it extremely difficult to find, I think, a, a soft, you know, a negotiated solution here. I think that's where we get Lebanon, though, again. I mean, right, Zsa is the only one who spent time in prison. That's the downside of leaving But, but Andrea, there. I have to come back because I dislike mischaracterizations of the day after project, particularly from those who were not participants. It is not a United States government initiative. It was funded in part by the United States. It was also funded by Germany, by Switzerland, and by an NGO in Holland. So this, we had um, multilateral funding. The committees themselves who worked on these are all Syrian. Our work was informed by experts from around the world who had participated in transitions in Libya, Yemen, Iraq, South Africa, Latin America. So I, I don't want any mischaracterizations here about it being a United States initiative. Please, thank you. <clears throat> okay, maybe at this point, if it's all right with the two of you, we could open up the floor and um, You're get enjoying this? no. I'm actually totally enjoying this, um, but I'm hoping that it'll be even yeah. more enjoyable if we get a few more other people in the mix. So I see Redwan and I see Tomas, and then we can take and then I see Joel and a woman in the back whose name I don't know. <clears throat> so we have four, and then um, maybe we'll take we'll uh, we'll have you four, but we'll take questions one at a time. Um, <clears throat> and <clears throat> I'm going to mimic you after you give your question on behalf of the television camera. So either you can come up here and ask your question at the podium, or I will rephrase your question. In a, okay, great. Take your risk. Yes, you can do yes, at risk of being misquoted. Uh, thank you, Rafif and Josh. Um, you, you come up actually with things uh, in, in the beginning of your presentation, then you ended up with the opposite. Um, and this is why that my question is related to the first part of your presentation. Uh, when you see that about the Alawite has been, uh, you even that you used a very strong word, uh, how the Syrian community dealt with the Alawite at that time. But don't forget actually that's related to the, uh, not only to the Alawite community, but to the all other communities who are in Syria in the 40s and the 50s. And, uh, that's it. and there, at that time, the Alawite community, they have minister in the 40s and the 50s, Suleiman Ahmed. And still, actually, the Syrian, they repeated his, his words as one of the heroes. And of course, Saleh Ali and others and others. This is why I think the Alawite, despite of some group of them, they called, they need for their own isolated state, there is a huge group of Alawites participated in, in, in the struggle for the independence from the French, and this is why they called Saleh al-Ali and others and others. <coughs> then my question that, I know the Alawite very well. I served in the army in 2004, 2005, and supposed actually the, the group I served was, is very loyal to the Rifat al-Assad, the brother of the former President Hafez al-Assad. Democrat, you mean? Uh, Saraya Difa. Saraya, called the Saraya Difa. And uh, that's, that's the, the brother of Hafez al-Assad, he's really a sectarian Alawite guy. He built his groups totally as Alawite. In the group I served as example, we have at that time 129 officers, 121 Alawite officers, only eight Sunni officers in that group. But when you spend some time them, actually, there is no a decision, intention decision by the Alawite group to go to the army. But there is no any kind of, of, uh, of institution or, or, uh, or programs and in their areas. This is why they use their con contacts and connection and to go to the army much easier for them to start to get money and all of that. This is why, and this is exactly what the half of the Assad the only minorities in Syria who they don't have their own courts and the Druze they have, the Christian they, they have, it's the Alawite. This is why the, the half of the Assad or the Assad dynasty, the Assad family, they don't want to ha the Alawite to have an independent leadership. 
even that in, in the state or the family affairs and all of that. And this is, n n n now, there is some families who's actually, they have the most no noble in among the Arawat community, like Al Khayyir, like Osman, uh, Osman and others and others, who's now opposing the Assad regime. Those we have to support them. It's the strategy we have in the opposition. There is nothing called guarantees we can offer the Alawite. This is something being repeated by the media, especially the State Department. You have to give them the guarantees. We don't have nothing to, to offer. But we can put the opposition figures, Alawite, as visible as much as we can. This is why the first ambassador was Alawite. And we ask, and we call them actually to appear in the media and to appeal to the Arawat community, to ask them to take distance uh, and all of that. This is the only thing we can do right, uh, uh, right now. But most important, there is no decision taking by the Arawat community. The Arawat community is not, it's, it's, the, it's like the Syrian, the, the Sunni community, is not one family can take one decision. There is no Majlis Milla or something like that. This is something already, this is such reputations or rumors about the Alawite. They have still, there's many divisions among them. Let me just make a, you talked about the Khair family. There are three major families in Qardaha, the town from which the Assads come from, and you mentioned them, the Osman and Khair. Now, the leading Khair guy went to Russia and went to China recently, and the Chinese and Russians were trying to cultivate him as potential, you know, if the Assads leave, he could take over and help them broker some kind of other leadership within the Alawite community. As soon as he got back from China about three months ago, he disappeared. I presume he's either dead or, you know, half dead. Assad is not going to give the Chinese and the Russians the pleasure of cultivating an alternative leadership within the Alawite community to save their interests. So Assad treats the Alawites in the same way that he treats the rest of Syria, which is as his little, I mean, and that's just an example of why it's very difficult to find an alternative leadership. But this is exactly why when you say that the Alawis are tying their security to that of Assad, that that is not true. Assad has shown repeatedly that he will sacrifice anybody, and your sectarian background has absolutely nothing to do with it. In Kordaha, specifically about three months ago, were the clashes between the families. And immediately after those clashes in Kordaha, you had something like 400 Facebook pages pop up. Alawis for the revolution, Alawis for democracy, Alawis against Assad. Right? So, so we can say that internally within the Alawi community, there is a split. You can say it. It, 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 it isn't going to change the situation because the military is stuck together and they're killing Sunnis. I mean, it, it, it hasn't fallen apart. You know, it might fall apart, but I don't think it will. I really don't. I think that, you know, I know lots of Alawites who, who hate this regime, they hate Assad, they understand that Assad has led them down this path to destruction. But they need Assad. Assad is their shield. They need him to bring his army back to the Alawite territory and make sure that all these militias don't march into it because then it's going to be rape and pillage. That's what they are assuming. So they need Assad, and that's the terrible dilemma. He has captured the Alawite community by getting rid of any alternative leadership and f making them so fearful of this alternative side. And so you've got your work cut out for you, which is to convince them to lay down their arms and it's going to be okay. I think we'll take a next question from Tomas. I think you also point to the risk for any minority, which is to give up the religious identity in favor of mm -hmm. the national. And that is a huge risk, right? We see it with the Druze in Lebanon, for example. And um, <clears throat> I don't know if it's your work cut out for you, but it does seem that that is a huge step and we, we, we see it. Okay, so I have a, okay, a question for each of you. The first for Afif. Uh, there is a, a group I didn't have the time to mention in my, my presentation. I mean, it's a small group in Aleppo. Uh, it, it, they're Islamists, but uh, I mean, there is a political wing and a military one. Uh, the guy I know in that group was a, a civil society activist before the revolution. And he told me, I mean, we, we want to have this you know, double structure, military and political, because we want armed groups to, to keep in touch with civil society. 
Uh, and I am already thinking about, I mean, how we will help these guys go back to civil life after the conflict. Uh, I'm not sure he will succeed, but at least he's thinking about it, and I think it's very important. I was wondering if the LCCs had you know, projects about how, to, I mean, engaging the armed groups and, and preparing the future uh, from that point of view. Uh, my question for Josh, it's, I'm um, sorry to go back to, to uh, geopolitical issues, but uh, so you mentioned this possibility of having the, the ex-Syrian army turned into a sectarian militia uh, located on the coast, um, maybe with some Iranian support. And my question was, do you think the Iranians are, are that loyal allies? I mean, they're loyal to, to, to Assad now because he's the, the, the president of Syria, which is an important state in the region. They're loyal, loyal to Hezbollah because it's a powerful militia that's facing Israel. Would they support uh, a sector and militia that's fighting Sunnis, uh, the, then uh, jeopardizing their relationship? For instance, with Egypt, I heard that uh, Morsi invited Ahmadinejad to, to visit Cairo. Uh, so Iran will maybe have will have, we'll have opportunities to rebuild a relationship with Egypt, maybe repair its relationship with Turkey, Qatar. So would they undermine all of that by supporting uh, a sectarian militia in Latakia, Watartus? Would you like to go first? Okay, um, I think they will. I do. Um, I think they have nothing to lose by supporting an Alawite militia in the same way that they support a, a Shiite militia um, in Lebanon. Because if they dump Assad, this is the same dilemma for the Russians and the, everybody else who, who've supported him. If they dump Assad and the Sunnis sweep the place clean, they're going to be loyal to Saudi Arabia and Turkey and America, the Sunnis, because they're going to need aid and they're going to need to be loyal to the people who give them money. Now, Iran and Russia will lose entirely the, all their influence. As you said you know, earlier, there's no place for these people. They understand that. The only way that Russia and Iran can maintain influence in Syria is if the Alawites maintain an enclave on the coast. Then they end up with something in the game. They got skin in the game, right? And that's better than having nothing. So that's the, you know, it's not, not a big brainer. It's not a, it's just they want to have something when all this is left is finished because then they'll 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 have a chip in the they'll have a bargaining chip in, in the future of Syria and the future of the region, and uh, America won't have wiped them off the map. With regard to the question about the FSA, uh, the LCC and other organizations are working with the, the Free Syrian Army. Uh, remember that the Free Syrian Army started with defectors and people who took up arms in self-defense. Uh, many of these people don't want to carry weapons. Uh, many of these people want to go back and create jobs and rebuild their country and clean their communities. Um, so that's part of the answer. We are working closely with different FSA battalions to make sure there's a transition back into civilian life. And we see some of this happening in areas like Zabadani in the Damascus suburbs where there is a local council that is a, a cooperative between military and civilian councils, a lot of collaboration, but the understanding that once there is peace in Syria, these military folks will drop the weapons and uh, go back into civilian life. Thank you. <clears throat> Joel, do you mind coming up to the podium and then we'll take the woman in back and then Mr. Ayub. So this is a really interesting panel. Uh, it's provocative and exciting, and um, I think I find myself, probably like many people in the audience, sort of pendulum swinging between the speakers and wondering who gets the last word in, because if we had to vote, we'd probably vote that way. Um, and that's why I, I guess you know accidents happen. I think it's really unfortunate that the third speaker couldn't be here. Um, and so I guess, and uh, I'd like for you guys, or maybe Tomas, I missed your, your talk earlier today, to kind of channel what, what he might have said, because my suspicion is, um, and I'd bet on it, that uh, at the end of the day, whenever the end of the day is, and however it comes about, that if there's any semblance of Syria left, uh, and certainly any semblance of civil society left, the Muslim Brotherhood is going to be in the majority, and it's going to be they 
who to a great extent will be shaping the state. Now they may be doing it wisely or unwisely. Um, and, and so the question really is what do they see? Um, how are they preparing? What kind of day after plans are they making? Now that's oftentimes talked about and I've kind of heard it spoken so far today for the brief period that I've been here as kind of an insidious thing, but uh, that's not necessarily the case either. Um, I think historically we need to recognize that you know, in many respects uh, it's their time. Uh, it certainly is in, uh, in the Arab world. Uh, the Islamist moment is, is here, for better, for worse, necessary or not. So what's, you know, what's their end of the day? Um, how do they see Syria? What's left? And to that extent, maybe, Josh, you know, while your models of the Levant are perfectly you know, spot on in terms of historically you know, the way you're thinking about things and the minority questions that, that don't really exist, um, North Africa maybe fits more in with the Turkish model in, in different ways, but it seems to me that uh, we need to also be looking at models in places like Tunisia uh, and Egypt. Um, and maybe this whole question of where Syria winds up will be um, molded in part by however long that takes and what kind of governments we see in, uh, in countries like that where the Ikhwan uh, will seemingly be uh, directing things for quite a while. So if, could we bring him in somehow and, um, and sort of speak to those issues? It's tough. I'm asking right, you to break away from I'm going to channel your... Mulham Drubi from the Muslim Brotherhood. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, I actually uh, know Mulham Drubi, and he was an active participant in the day after project. So uh, I've had a, a good opportunity to speak with him. Um, I do not support the Muslim Brotherhood. I, I believe by their very name they are exclusionary and sexist. Um, but I think... Mulham Drubi would tell you that the Muslim Brotherhood, the Syrian Muslim Brotherhood, has moderated its tone. It is far less um, conservative than its Egyptian counterparts. I believe Mus uh, Mulham Drubi would tell you that if the Muslim Brotherhood were to take over in Syria, they would revert to the 1950 Constitution they would strike language that says that the president must be a Sunni Muslim. Uh, in fact, this was his recommendation during the day after working groups. Uh, I think he would tell you that he believes in having uh, everybody uh, equal under the rule of law and that um, I don't remember where we left the argument about uh, some people were saying that different communities should have their own legal systems. Many of us objected to this completely saying, we are one nation, not multiple court systems. Um, but I would tell Mulham Zrubi, if he were here, that what we've seen among the activist networks, even the religious communities, that they fear something like the Muslim Brotherhood because of what is happening in Egypt and because they recognize that they have spent two years, and by then it may be much longer than two years, they would have spent that time overthrowing a dictator, and they are not prepared to replace one dictator with another. So this would be the response to, to Mulham Zrubi. I think Syria will be very lucky to get the Muslim Brotherhood. Um, if they could have a Muslim Brotherhood or al Nahda party, it would solve a lot of Syria's problems because it would unify the country. Uh, but uh, the Muslim Brotherhood was largely destroyed by Assad. And so Syria is left in a very unenviable position of not having a Muslim Brotherhood that would stand for a middle class, a merchant class, a sort of a, 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 a voice of Islamic middle ground. And Syria is going to fight to try to rebuild that voice and that party. And it's going to be a difficult struggle because it has been so destroyed. And it would be an answer. I mean, I, wish, I only wish Syria had a stronger Muslim Brotherhood. Now, that being said, um, Syria has a problem because you know you say that they're going to get rid of Article Three, which says that the president has to be a Muslim. But in '73, when Assad tried to get rid of that article, there were giant demonstrations throughout Syria. Syrian textbooks that you know every Syrian in public school has to study Islam or Christianity. Right? You have two. There's a religion class that meets twice a week, and you have to go to it. And either you go to the Christian one or the Muslim one. In those books, there is not one mention of Alawites, Druze, or any of the minorities. And it says 
that if you're not a person of the book, you have to be, you have to fight against them or convert them. And the Syrian textbooks have said this for 40 years under the Assads because they had not, they didn't have the temerity and the guts to try to change that language because it's in the, because it's the ethos of the Syrian people, which is not separation of church and state. And to undo that language, because the Alawites go back to being Alawites, right? They have, Alawites suffer a terrible identity crisis today because Assad, in order to be president, said we're Muslims, which is a lie. It's not a really lie, but it's a lie in the face of all the other Syrians. It's like Mormons. Mormons say they're Christians, and evangelicals say they're not, right? Because they add a book and they add a prophet, and you can't do that. Um, now, most American Christians say, we don't care. You believe in Jesus and the, and the Bible. That's enough. And so that's what the Alawites say. We believe in the Quran, and we believe in Muhammad, and you know, love us. But the trouble is, they think Ali is God, and they do a lot of other, they don't do the five pillars of, you know, their heterodoxy is so outrageous by a traditional Muslim point of view that they're not Muslims. Now, they don't know that, really. They don't accept that, because Assad has pounded into their head that they're Muslims. But they're not Muslims, and they're not accepted as Muslims. What do you do with them? If they become a separate religion, all of those textbooks have to be changed to say that Alawites are not Kafir, that Alawites can have their own religion in Syria. It's a, it's a, real, it's a real problem. You know, I, I couldn't get married in Syria because I'm not a Christian. I wasn't baptized. I had to prove, you know, I converted to Islam to marry an Alawite woman. Right? <laughs> Uh, the, the big joke in my family was that I became a Sunni so I could marry the Alawite. And, uh, because you can't convert to, to becoming an Alawite. Now, as an atheist, I thought I can be an atheist in any religion. It doesn't really matter. But in order to become married in Syria, I had to prove, you know, I had this little document that I got in Oklahoma City saying I was a Muslim. And they said, well, what were you before you were a Muslim? They want to know, this is Muhabarat, they want to know that you're not a Jew and you're not sneaking in to try to be a spy, right? And, uh, and I couldn't drop my trousers because I was circumcised. So, uh, excuse me for being vulgar, but I couldn't, I couldn't prove that I was not a Jew because I didn't have baptismal papers. So we ended up couldn't get married, right? I mean. I'm just giving you that example because it's not a secular society and it's not a secular laws and Syria faces this problem and it's going to face this problem uh, in spades once the Alawites are out and everybody's going to have to decide whether they're Muslims or not Muslims and if they're not Muslims what do you do with them? They haven't figured it out for themselves. They're in a complete identity crisis. At any rate, it, it's, it's, it's a very deep problem, and Syrian society hasn't dealt with any of these problems. Uh, and they're lying out there. And when you ask everybody, how are you going to deal with this, they don't have an answer, because Syrians haven't really thought about it. Um, I'm going to have this rare moment where I agree with Josh on something. Great. Let's talk <laughs> um, more about circumcision. But I would say everybody's having an identity crisis. It's not just the Alawi community. Yeah. Um, there are Syrian seculars, there are Syrian atheists, there are Syrian uh, radical Christians, there are radical Muslims, there are, it's, it's like lumping Americans into one or two or three buckets, you cannot do that. So I think Syrians have to look at their identity, they have to be able to say what they want. We have not been able to articulate what we want, we've only been able to say what we don't want. And so this may interest you as another rosy-eyed optimistic effort, but we are launching a freedom charter and we'll go around Syria documenting what people want and asking them to specify what they see in the future of the educational system. Now, I don't know if you went to school in Syria, but I did. I can tell you that curriculum needs to be undone. And there are plans, in fact, to revamp the school curriculum from pre-K all the way to postgraduate studies, in large part because there is such a Baathist influence on it. It's not Baathist, it's Islamic influence. Uh, there is, like I said, I went to school in Syria, and I remember this very well. Uh, the educational system needs to be completely revamped. 
Okay, let's take a question from the woman in the back. Would you mind coming up to the podium so we can have you officially recorded for the, <coughs> for the paparazzi? <laughs> I'm just uh, I'm sorry, but I'm really feeling like sick to my stomach on some of the stuff that uh, I'm suffering. I'm from that area, and I uh, have a, a question. Can I direct it? I heard so many dis uh, contradicting uh, uh, statements that, <coughs> meanwhile, I know and part of my family are dying there. Um, so it's me. It's real. So I'm a bit nervous also. Now, some of the statements that I heard from here today and uh, yeah, uh, earlier, one is that we don't, there is no leadership. Now, as you mentioned, there is a crisis, identity crisis. Syrians do not want to, do not know what to do. They don't know what they want. Uh, we have um, no negotiations. We have warring militias. A lot of them are foreign, that are having and killing people. Atrocities all over the place. I don't know if you're documenting the militias and the free army, Syria free army atrocities. Um, I have family who call me from there, tell me actually what's happening. And it's not as rosy. Free Syria army is a disaster. And, um, and they're killing people and committing abuses. Um, we have, um, you know, advocates of international interventions and we saw what using the of all places the libya model which we know that more people got killed under the protection of uh, of freedoms after Gaddafi left and they are standing by the bread lines we all know that and then we 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 sit here and i'm sorry uh, about um talking about how we're gonna kill more and I really was offended, I'm sorry, but I was offended at the first sentence that you said, that the negotiations, of, the only negotiation is a rope around, you know, and I'm like, what can a leadership, and you talk about the leadership, indeed, who put you first leaders, sorry, but I am so sick and tired of this bloodthirsty talk when negotiations are completely out of the question from, and I'm so sick to my stomach of what I heard. And lastly, I would like to ask, we are here in an academic, under an academic institution roof. I would have, as a citizen, would like to have, and I did leave a message for you, what is actually the Syrian, uh, not the government, but Mother Syria representative. I look at Mother Syria. I don't care for Assad. But I call, I see, and I was there in Syria last year and six months ago on the border, talked to the people, saw the refugees. And all I see is bloodthirsty. Let's kill them, let's get more militias, let's arm and let's and let's and let's. I need a solution. And the Baathist, I'm sorry, and I learned about the Baathist in Jordan, there is a pan-Arab. They're not the Alawites also. They're, why in Jordan people totally against what you guys are doing? They are. I look at the newspapers. The blood thirsty, and I'm sorry I'm getting emotion, emotional, but I have the family there and they call me from Dara, from, from Damascus, and we know what's going on and it's not as what you just said, and it's not also as limited as, as, as uh, uh, Anyway, and please address somebody would address the role of the foreign fighters that are committing also these massacres, what we never heard about from here. How are you going to get rid of them? Thank you. Thank you. So let me first apologize for offending you. It was not my intention to offend anyone. Um, I use that quote merely to illustrate, I would say, the majority of the Syrian opposition's unwillingness to enter into any direct negotiations with a man who has ordered the killing of more than 60,000 people. This is 60,000 people we can document. Uh, approximately 70% uh, of the nation's infrastructure has been destroyed. 
Uh, I do not believe there is a single formal opposition group that will sit across the table with their executioner. So that's why I use the, the quote. I apologize if that was offensive. Uh, with regard to the Free Syrian Army and the foreign fighters, absolutely there have been atrocities committed by them. They have been documented. The idea is for us to prosecute them. We, can, we are not in a position to prosecute them today. Uh, the estimates I've heard on the foreign fighters, and Joshua may have a different number, what I've heard is it's anywhere between 7,000 and 10,000 foreign jihadists. This is growing every week, and it's, of course, of extreme concern to us because they are committing atrocities, because they do think they're coming there to wage some sort of Islamic jihad, and this is not what we're about. Uh, so to your point, it is of concern. What I know, and this is only one narrow perspective, is that uh, free Syrian army commanders in Aleppo gave the foreign jihadists in Aleppo the instruction to leave. And they gave them a threat. You either leave on your own or we send you out. Now, I don't think they've been particularly successful, but the intent was there. Radwan may have a different perspective on it. Joshua may have a different perspective. I don't, you know, I, obviously foreign fighters are a problem. And uh, the, the biggest problem, though, I think is unity and trying to finish this fighting because Syrians are getting radicalized. And, and the majority of, you know, al-Nusra or the other militias that one has prescribed are not foreigners. Uh, they are Syrians. And the difficulty is going to be trying to unite the different groups. And that's, that's going to be, you know, that's the biggest challenge. The foreigners don't, I mean, I, I'm sure they're going to be a problem, but they're, they're not going to be as big a problem as trying to find some kind of common ground and unity amongst the various militias. And that's the, and the longer this goes on, the more radicals. But, you know, I don't think American intervention was going to stop this process. We intervened in Iraq, and in three weeks we decapitated the regime. And we had exactly the same result, which is radicalization, lots of militias, and, um, and very bad sectarian fighting. Because there wasn't really an Iraq there. And the country had to be completely remade. And it was a very contested process. And I think that you know, if the Americans had killed, decapitated this regime, there would have been a month or two of quiet. But it's very possible all hell would have broken loose. I don't know if that's true. That's what happened in Iraq, in a sense. That's what happened in Lebanon. But my, 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 my fear is, is that this number of militias would not have been avoided. Maybe it wouldn't have been, a ba it wouldn't have been as bad. It might not have been as radicalized. But you would have had the same kind of divisions uh, that would have crept up. And I think that's why you had the Assad regime for 40 years. The Assad regime was an exp a very narrow, corrupt regime, but it was an expression of the lack of Assyria. Because if there had been national unity, this regime would not have ruled for 40 years and done the damage it did. And it did that damage in part because it's brutal, but in part because it could divide and rule Syrians at will. And, um, and it became a master at doing that. And that, that was a Syrian problem. And you know, we look back at the golden age of Syrian democracy from 1946 up to the Ba'athist takeover in 63. But we have to remember that Khawatli, the first Sunni president who presided over this democracy, he broke the constitution in 47 in order to give himself a second term, which infuriated Syrians. And then he refused to create a national unity party in 47 when he had a, in 48, excuse me, 48 when there was a national crisis. And he put only Damascenes in the government. And he, used, he declared martial law and brought Husni Zaim, the head of the army, onto the streets to crack the heads of all the demonstrators and all the parties that were demonstrating in Damascus in 48 after the Palestinian war when there was big opposition to his government. And he beat them all up and threw them into jail. And then there was a first military coup. And he did that because he did not trust his own countrymen. He would refuse to make a coalition with the People's Party of Aleppo. He did not like the Aleppo. He got only Damascenes and put Khalid al -Azam in there. And, and, but the problem was there. The problem of breaking the Constitution 
and then using military might to suppress demonstrators was already the problem amongst the first Sunni president after independence, and it happened within a year. There wasn't a golden age of democracy. There was stumbling along with 20 or so coups and false coups until the Ba'ath Party took over because it was a banana republic, because Syria had not formed this national consensus that was required for some kind of consensual politics. And it hasn't done that yet, and that's going to be the big challenge. Okay, if we could take Professor Ayub next, and while you come up, I think, um, I think to the question of, of violence in particular, I think that um, it's something that we've seen throughout this conference is a kind of going up and down to discussions at the, that focus on the local level, to discussions that focus more on the national level, to the ones that focus on the more international level. And the further up in the scale we go, I think the more abstracted the conversation often becomes. And I also think it's, it's also a language issue. It's much easier to have access to local stories, to individual stories, mm -hmm. if you have access to Arabic. And so I think that when we talk in broader strokes, we tend to speak also at a more abstract level. Anyway. Thank you very much, Andrew. Well, first of all, let me uh, welcome Josh to the fold. Now we can proudly say we are six million and one. <laughs> uh, there's two, two, two points that I wanted to make. One in regard to Iran, uh, and I heard you say that uh, Iran and Russia, but particularly Iran, would like to keep this, uh, the, the, the other white un enclave if it comes into existence as a strategic uh, asset. Uh, I disagree. I think if Assad and the other whites lose Damascus, their strategic value for Iran disappears because there is no Syria. It's not, it, one, it cannot doubt Syria as its, its major Arab ally and so on and so forth. The, the, the Alawites in the mountains wouldn't be a conduit of, of aid and assistance to the Hezbollah. They would not be a part of the resistance front. So I think the Iranians are pragmatic enough that if Damascus is lost, that they would be willing to make compromises. Uh, the other thing, a point that hasn't come up, but as I think about this whole issue of American policy towards the Syrian crisis, I think it's a bit naive, uh, as Syrian activists tend to believe, that the United States is firmly committed. It's firmly committed probably to the overthrow of Assad for a whole host of reasons, but is firmly committed to it being supplanted by a unified Syrian government uh, under a coalition that would represent the entire nation. And the reason for that is that we know, and I don't want to go, to go into, into details of this, that American policy towards the Middle East, particularly the Arab world, well, the Middle East in general, uh, toward, towards, uh, Iraq, towards Palestine, but not merely Palestine, Iran, Iraq, Lebanon, is heavily influenced by inputs, by Israeli inputs, or not even by inputs, by its concern for Israeli interests. And the Israelis are very conflicted at the moment about Syria. On the one hand, they would like the Assad regime to go because it is a strategic asset for Iran. On the other hand, they are apprehensive that, about what would replace it. Uh, Assad at least has kept the border quiet. An Islamist government or a Muslim Brotherhood-led government may reopen the political, not the military issue, on the border. So it's in Israel's interest to see Syria in a long-term uh, sort of, uh, in, in, in long-term engaged in civil conflict, in warlordism, and uh, in a disarray that goes on not merely for years, but probably for decades. And I think the Americans are aware, are aware of that. Mm -hmm. And as a result, would take that into consideration in finally making their policy towards Syria. I don't disagree with you. I don't think the Americans are going to come save us. Uh, very quickly on the Iranian issue once again. You know, if Iran has an enclave, it can keep Syria from consolidating in the Saudi orbit. And it can keep Syria from challenging Maliki and the Shiites of Iraq. Because, you know, I think Iran looks at this as a domino theory, that once the dominoes fall, uh, Iran's going to be next, because America wants regime change in Iran, and if they can eliminate Syria, they've weakened Iran, and then Iran's next. So the longer you can make trouble over Syria and just keep the focus somewhere else besides Tehran, the better it is for Tehran. And um, so I think, you know, I think that Tehran will be a, a mischief maker 
uh, a mischief maker. That's the wrong, that's an American perspective. I think Iran will look for its national interests and support the people who uh, like it, which are the Alawites. And they will, why give them up? Why throw the Shiites under the bus? I mean, even if they're not real Shiites. The, the thing is, they like Iran. And uh, they want Iran, and they need Iran. Okay, I saw a hand from Ridwan and other questions that we might keep in the pipeline. So, yes. Okay. So, do you want to go and then? Yes, uh, yes, the okay, can you just go from the podium? So, or I have to repeat you. Uh, sure. <laughs> uh, just a short first. comment about every society has extremists. But the question how to deal with such extremists. In Syria, actually, because the brutality of the Assad regime and the inaction from the international community, they gave access them to arm themselves. And those, of course, will be a huge concern to the Syrian in the future. Everyone actually surprised in the in Egypt elections. They have 21% of Salafists. The Salafists are actually though, the most radical ideas among the, 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 the Islamists. But then the Salafi, they form a political party, you know how they have different divisions. <coughs> then at least the society tried to, uh, and now they're moving a little bit to the mainstream, uh, at least uh, the, the mainstream of the, the Muslim moderates. But now in, in, in Syria, the situation pushed them to take arms. I just watched yesterday a one-hour YouTube of Jabhat al-Nusra about the most extremist operation they did in, in Aleppo, in Saadullah al-Jabiri, where they have four explosions in Al-Amir uh, Hotel and others. The two guys, the two guys who did this suicide at, at attacks on the hotel, one of them from Aleppo, he's a physician. <coughs> His son been killed and his father been killed, and actually his wife's been raped. And that's pushed him to take, a, even that he's a physician, but has nothing uh, to do. And the same guy, he's an uh, English teacher from Idlib. Who this, and that gives you a sense that, that the, whole, the whole society has been pushed to radicalization. If there is no, an, an, an action has been taken, there is, an, there is no stop for this process. And now when we have, if we see jihad is coming, which I don't think this very high percentage, the percentage we have, three to five percentage from the Free Syrian Army, would still under control. But later on, if they left Syria and more and more, those, those the jihadis who they, they have the short interest for them to the end of the Assad regime will move to the global jihad. And this is uh, the, the main idea of the Al-Qaeda. We moved from, from Afghanistan to the, to the global jihad. And this is the fear we have as a Syrian and the concern, which always they are, uh, the, the needs to organize the FSA, the need to take actions to end the whole Syrian crisis. Great. So let's take. Um, I'm sorry. I remember you saying your name earlier, but I forgot what it was. But you could, <clears throat> great. If if you it's you can come to the podium, or I can repeat you. So. I have uh, two questions to Ratif, and I have one comment for Professor Ayub. My first co a co a question to you is, based on your experience, we know about activists and organizations on the ground. How could you cooperate with others in, in the sphere of lack of trust and fear? How you overcome this? Because I think it's a huge challenge to cooperate. My, my second question is about the role of women. How women are involved, not only in the opposition, but from the regime side. We don't know a lot about that side. And in particular, Ismail Assad. My comment about Israel, <laughs> I think actually civil war in, in Syria is a threat to Israel. Why is that? Because we, seen, we see after the revolution in Egypt, we see Sinai, non-state actors, terrorists who attack Israel from Sinai. 
We see that in a weaker Gaza. So I think actually civil war in Syria or failed state in Syria could be a major threat to Israel. And I think that's from Israel's side, I think Israel should have a more stable Syria than a failed state Syria. Thanks. All right, so your first question, I think, was about overcoming uh, fear and mistrust or distrust among activists. Um, I'm in the very fortunate position that when I started supporting the, the LCC, they already had their networks. And as activists were detained or killed, the LCC on the ground there in the different committees started replacing them. And so um, we uh, have quite a few activists. Uh, by the time I start working with them, they're already vetted. Uh, we know that activists are under surveillance. We know there are a lot of informants, and so you start, as you would with anything, small bits of information, and you gradually expand the scope until you know that the person is trusted. Um, it's been extremely challenging for people on the ground. The original founders of the LCC uh, Many of them are dead. Uh, those who have survived, there are some in hiding who move from their place of residence every two days. And others are in permanent uh, in exile until this is done. Um, so I think that answers your question. And the other one was about the role of women. But you're saying not from the opposition side, more from the pro-regime side. From the both. So, I really can't speak to pro-regime women. Uh, I can talk about relatives of mine who feel this is an Islamic uprising and who think that Bashar al-Assad is God. Um, and they are concerned that uh, when these radical, bearded, Salafi Muslims come take over, that they're going to be uh, reduced to uh, not driving or, or being forced to pull their kids out of school. Their, their daughters. Um, this is what I know from the pro-regime folks. Uh, from my perspective, from the opposition, I feel that women have been, in large part, the backbone of the revolution. A lot of the civil disobedience tactics were generated by women. A lot of the initial protests with the women in, in uh, Dara and in Dareya doing uh, sit-ins, uh, lying across highways to prevent cars. Um, women have been really at the forefront of this revolution. Uh, most recently, we have Rima Dali and three others, uh, the Alawi and Christian Brides of Peace, who stood in front of the souk wearing wedding dresses and holding signs saying, both sides, stop the killing. Those women are still in detention. Um, I'm working with a great number of women who are forming different NGOs, who are uh, presenting petitions to the uh, opposition coalition and other organizations saying we demand 50% representation. It's an argument we're having within the context of the day after group because I am demanding 60% uh, representation, but I'm saying I'll settle for 50. So it, we, we are out there. We are uh, not willing to take a back seat. Josh, do you want to comment on the Israel <clears throat> perspective on, on the question of what a Syrian border, whether a distressed Syrian border would be better or worse for Israel? Or no, obviously Israel, uh, Israel is torn uh, because Assad was a good neighbor uh, and didn't go to war against him. And obviously he helped Hezbollah and Hamas and was a pest. But he was a weak pest and he kept Islamists at bay. And uh, now they're building a fence because they don't know what's going to happen. They're going to build a wall across the Golan. And I assume that just about everybody in the region is going to do the same thing. They're going to surround Syria. You know, nobody's going to intervene in Syria because it's too big a problem. And there's no interest. And America has had no interest in Syria for 30-something years since we've had sanctions. We don't have any trade. We don't, we don't care about Syria. There are no Syrianists employed in, in Washington, D.C. You know, Syria was an adjunct of the Arab-Israeli conflict. The only person, the only Syrianist who ever got hired in Washington, D.C. was Andrew Tabler, who was a very good Syrianist, spent five years there, and he got hired by WINEP, Washington Institute for Near East Policy, mm -hmm. because, you know, which is, a, which is sort of a break off of APEC. And because they're interested, and they need to, you know, Syrian policy in Washington is important to them, and they needed a Syrian expert who could speak intelligently about Syrian matters. But nobody else, Brookings, you know, you can take, go right through 
all the other think tanks, they don't have a Syrianist because who cares? Now, that's bad for the Syrian revolution because they're not going to get any kind of intervention. I mean, obviously, there's <laughs> fatigue and everything else. But I think all the bordering states are terrified. Damascus is going to be a much harder city to take because the neighboring states, Lebanon, Israel, Jordan, and Iraq, are all inimical to the rebels, unlike Turkey, which has helped them, given them a base, and they can run back and forth to Aleppo very easily. But the Jordanians don't want it. Um, they don't like these rebels. They know that there's going to be a lot of blowback in Jordan, just like there was in Iraq, where Zarqawi and all the others learned how to use arms. And they came home and they made trouble. And that's going to happen in Jordan. Um, so I, I think that Israel and all the neighboring countries are very frightened, just as America and everybody else, and Turkey is too, are very frightened that it's going to be millions of refugees. And Syria is a country of 23 million people. When Assad set up the sort of authoritarian state and socialist system that still rules in Syria, there were less, there were about 8 million people. And he could subsidize fuel and give them jobs, and it, it worked. It no longer works. There are way too many people. There's not enough water. There's not enough anything in Syria. And, and in this kind of environment where the economy has collapsed and the Syrian pound has collapsed, there are going to be millions of refugees. And the neighbors are all battening down the hatches because they know they're going to come. And those refugees that are in Turkey are going to want to become Turks. They're going to want to go to Turkish schools and get jobs in Turkey. I mean, one, two year, two years in a camp gets boring. They're going to want to have a future. And they're not going to be able to go back to Syria for a long time. And so all these neighbors are going to have real problems on their hands uh, with this outflow of Syrians. And uh, you know, my Alawite family all went to Lebanon two weeks ago to try to get American visas. And they were, of course, all denied because nobody wants them. And uh, nobody wants a Syrian today because they're a big problem. And they're going to stay in your country, and they're not going to go home again. Uh, and that's the, you know, and I'm sure for Israel it's the same, you know, it's the same as all these other neighboring countries. It's a, it's a, it's a problem. Okay, so on that heartening note, we have come nearly to the end of our time. Um, I think that this has been a really prodigious effort by both Rafif and Josh to lay out the broad spectrum of <clears throat> the real challenges and also the real initiatives that are going forth, that the road <clears throat> is long, apparently Don't limbed with Don't blood, <laughs> um, rocky, um, but it is a road. And I think that if it's a road, then you can walk on it. And I think um, you've both done a really thoughtful job. Joel described this as kind of a pendulum presentation. I'm not sure that it really is much of a pendulum as a very sobering but reflective <clears throat> discussion of the current situation at the international level. We've, we have a sense of kind of what the capacities are and what we might think of as the responsibilities at the national level and also at the local level <clears throat> inside and outside the country and that the, the challenges are tremendous <clears throat> and the challenges inside for people who are living in the daily reality are even more so. Um, but I think that what you've done is to lay out very helpfully and very thoughtfully a sense of what the current situation looks like and what it might take to move forward with various scenarios. So thank you very, very much. Please join me in thanking them. Thank you.